want to ask you a very important question. When you're my age, when you're 58 years old, when you have lived life for another 35 and 40 years, would you rather have a resume or would you rather have a testimony? Would you rather have that which you can do, which is a resume, and it's impressive, or would you rather have what God can do, which is a testimony? You will graduate from Truett McConnell College, and that will go on your resume, and that will be impressive, but it will be your testimony that changes the lives of people around you. And I wonder, when you're my age, when you have lived life, will you still desire a testimony of Christ regardless of the resume? And I believe that if you take this verse of Scripture, which I believe was a life verse of the Apostle Paul, and if you apply it to your life, if you embrace it for your life, you will have a testimony, and it won't matter what your resume says because you will have impacted people for the cause of Christ. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, one verse. And in our church, we stand for the reading of God's Word, and I would encourage you and invite you to stand with me as we look at one verse, Galatians 2, 20. Paul writes these words in the very first letter of 13 that he had written. And I believe he gives to us his life verse, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is I that no longer lives, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Let's pray. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that it would be true for us that we would indeed be crucified, that it would be you that lives powerfully and mightily within us. Lord, that we'd walk by faith all the way to the finish line no matter what, to the end that we would have a testimony that would linger long after our lives are done upon this earth. May you alone receive the glory from it, through it. We thank you for it. We ask it in the precious and powerful and life-changing name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. I think the Apostle Paul was telling us three things in this one verse. He said, first of all, there is a funeral that I have attended, and it's my own. I have been crucified with Christ. And I have no doubt that for most of us, if not all of us, we at some level have heard about the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has died upon the cross at Calvary. But I'm not so sure that we always think about what that entails. We know that Christ died upon the cross. But Jesus Christ was, was crucified for you and for me. And upon that cross, he not only bore the sins of the world, but he became the sins of the world. And he was scourged, and this fragelion lacerated his flesh as that Roman preliminary for every crucifixion. And he was hung upon the cross with seven-inch square tapered spikes that would be driven through his hands and his feet. And he was mocked, and he was laughed at, and he was scorned. And he hung there for six hours, and he spoke seven times from the cross. And he died upon the cross. We did not kill Jesus Christ. He told us that I have the authority to lay it down, and no man takes my life away. I have the authority to lay it down. And I have the authority to take it up. But one thing is certain, Jesus Christ died upon the cross, and he died for you and me. I'm struck by what Paul said when he said, I've been crucified with Christ. He could have said anything to communicate his love for the Lord. He could have said, I admire the Lord Jesus Christ. But that wasn't strong enough. It wasn't good enough. He could say, I'm passionate for Christ. But that wasn't strong enough. That wasn't good enough. He could have said, I'm chasing hard after Christ. But still, that wasn't good enough. It wasn't strong enough. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. And what was he saying? He was saying, I believe I'm all in. And the soul of Tarsus that you once knew is no more. I have been crucified with Christ. And one thing is clear about my life from this forward go moment going forward. Paul of Tarsus is dead. 
I have been crucified with Christ. I've been a pastor for 28 years. I've been in the ministry for 30. And I've done a lot of funerals. And I've attended a lot of funerals. In fact, the very first church that Mary and I served in in North Carolina, we were there for three years and three months. And in that short period of time, I did 28 funerals. 28. And a deacon came up to me one day and he said, Preacher, we weren't dying until you showed up. And I said, well, that might have just been bad timing, but I learned some things about funerals, and dead people have taught me some things, believe it or not. But I've gone to a lot of funeral homes, and I've gone to a lot of funerals, and I've officiated a lot of them, but never, not one time, has anyone ever walked into a funeral home and said, hey, can you tell me where the dead body is? Everybody knows where the dead body is. It's in the casket or it's in the urn. Everyone can completely agree that's where the dead person is. And it struck me one day, I wonder if Christ walked into this place today. If he walked into most churches today, would he have trouble finding where the dead people are? Because you see, what we do is we give him pieces and not the whole. We say, Lord, thank you for my salvation. Thank you for for loving me and dying for me and writing my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Here's 10%. Lord, thank you that that you left your home in glory and you walked upon sinful earth and you you died that cruel death and you died for me and you didn't have to. Here's 20%. And we give him pieces and we give him 30% and 40% and 50%. And the Lord is saying to us over and over again, I don't want 40%. I don't want 50%. I don't even want 95%. I want all of you. I want 100%. I want you all in. And here's a radical thought. The Holy Spirit cannot resurrect that which isn't dead. That's what a resurrection is. You are dead and now you're alive. And the Holy Spirit will not resurrect that which is not dead. And I'm not saying you can't be saved, but what I'm saying is that you will never know the power of a resurrected life until you have put on the altar you and you have died to you. That's when you know the power of a resurrected life. And that's what Paul was saying. I have been crucified with Christ. I am not living. I have laid down. And you know what happens when you can lay down your life? The greatest enemy that you'll ever face is not the devil. It's not the world. It's not other people. It's you. That's the greatest enemy you'll ever face. But when you can slay the dragon of you, when you can slay that dragon, there is a, there's no authority in this world that has power over you, and there's no power in this world that has authority over you except Jesus Christ and Him alone. And man, that's a wonderful place to be, and I'm not there, and I'm not sure if any of us are there, but that's what Jesus Christ is calling us to. I want you all in. I want you dead so you can be fully alive in me. And Paul says, I have been crucified I have been crucified with Christ. Are you dead? How close are you to being dead? 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%. It's a radical thought. It's counterintuitive to this world's thinking. For me to gain my life, I have to lose it. I have to lay it down. And we hold on to it tenaciously because the world says, have it your way. You're worth it. You count. Yes, we do. But we discover what Christ is giving to us when we finally lay down our lives. And that is hard. That's hard. It's tough. It is the battle that we will face as long as we draw the breath of life. Several years ago, Chuck Swindoll preached in Atlanta I don't even know the occasion why he was there, but I drove to hear him because he was then and he still is now one of my favorite preachers, an amazing man of God. And he got up, and I've never read it, I've never heard it, but I heard it that day, and and it's an amazing story that I'll never forget. But he stood up there and he was confessional, and, and he was talking about walking a life that is surrendered to Christ. And and he told this amazing story that when he was a young preacher. In his 30s, maybe, he said, my star was just starting to rise and I was writing and people were reading my books and I was getting invited to different conferences and and, and I was becoming well-known and that was great and wonderful and I was invited to this preaching conference and I preached one night and I went back to my hotel, which was at the top floor of a high-rise hotel and he said, it had been a particularly good evening and 
and the Lord had spoken and lives had been changed and I'm walking in the glow of that experience and I stepped onto this elevator and I'm going up and just to show you how quick you can get out of the spirit and get into the flesh, it's amazing, isn't it? Like in a nanosecond, you can go from the spirit to the flesh in no time flat. And he said, I, I stood in this elevator all by myself and I'm going up to the top floor and about halfway up, the elevator stopped and this woman got on. And he said, I'm, I wasn't so sanctified at that time that I didn't know that this woman was a beautiful woman. And you know, I know she could say things verbally, visually, non-verbally, and it was very, very clear when she stood on that elevator with me all by myself and, she, and he said, I was still a good looking man back then. She made it very clear what her intentions were. And he said, I politely rebuffed her. I was tempted. I recognized the temptation. I politely rebuffed her. And she stood off the elevator. My elevator continued to go up to the floor. When the doors closed and I was by myself once again, I realized my hands were in my pockets. And he let it sit there for a moment. He said, I put my hands in my pockets not because I didn't trust myself with my hands to do what they shouldn't have done, but cognitively I didn't think about it, but I realized that my hands were in my pockets when she stood and went off the elevator. And then it dawned on me my wedding band was on my left hand. And I didn't think it cognitively, but I did it automatically. And I could barely hold it together till that elevator got to my floor and I went off the elevator and got to my room as fast as I could and I shut the door and I fell on my face and I wept like a baby because I realized that I was not dead yet. And I listened to him tell that story and I thought, you know, his standard isn't just not to fall morally, his standard is to be dead. And I think, God, help me to be dead. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Are you dead yet? Are you dead yet? He goes on to say something about a filling, not just a funeral, but a filling. What does he say? It is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. You know, we read that verse and we move on to other things and we forget the majesty and the wonder and the power of that. But I believe that you can ponder that, you can think upon that, you can dissect that, and you can look at that and you can listen to that for a lifetime and you'll never begin to mind the depths and the power and the majesty and the wonder of what Paul is saying. It's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Christ lives in me. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and filled all of the believers. And Paul wrote about it often in his 13 letters. In Colossians 1, 27, he said, it's Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. That's what he said in Philippians 1, 6. He said that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. In the second chapter, he said, God who, who work is Work in you is both to change you to will and to work for his good pleasure. And I love what Adrian Rogers says about that text. He said, I, I, I can be carnal if I want to. I, I can go drinking if I want to. I can, I can live like the world if I want to, but I don't want to because Jesus changed my want to. God is at work in me, changing my want to. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 that you're earthen vessels, but you house a heavenly treasure. One of my favorite passages is in Ephesians 3, 20. Now to him who is able to do far more beyond anything that we think or ask, to him be the glory according to the power that mightily works within us. I love what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. I remember in Greek class, and I know Dr. Pelletier is here and he might correct me, I don't know, but in Greek there are two words for temple. There's the word heron, and it speaks of the outer courts. But then there's a word that speaks of the holy of holies, the most holy place, and that's the word naos. And that's what Paul used when he said, you and I 
are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. We're the naos. We're the most holy sanctuary in which the presence of Christ dwells. It is no longer I li who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. The Bible calls us holy, hagias. We're saints. We've been set apart. And I think about this world that assails itself against the Spirit of God in us. The things that we see, the things that we hear, and there has to be a constant filter to keep the world out because of the precious treasure within us. There has to be a constant defense to that which the world would in, in, it bring in way of impurity in us in order to sanctify and keep sacred and protected and set apart the treasure of Jesus Christ who lives within us. And it's a strong battle. Let me give you an example. What do you think Helen First Baptist Church would do if I went to church one Sunday and I'd gone to the liquor store and I'd grabbed myself a Budweiser beer or a bottle of wine or a bottle of champagne and we're an alcohol tobacco free campus, amen? Just like Truett McConnell. Well, what do you think that church would do if I walked into that sanctuary and as I put my Bible down, I put a Budweiser beer right beside it, popped the top, and took a couple of swigs from it? Man, they would be incensed, and rightfully so. They would be upset, and rightfully so. They would form a committee to run me out of town, rightfully so, for I dared bring that which should not have ever been in a holy place. But I asked the question, if people are going to get upset that a beer was brought into a building, what is the greater temple? And yet we think nothing about putting that into this temple. Dr. Phil Calvert gave me this illustration. I thought it was so profound. I'll pass it on to you. But he said, Jim, when I was his pastor, what would you do if you woke up at 3 in the morning and there were a couple of people on your front porch that you did not know engaged in an in illicit activity on your front porch at 3 in the morning? And I said, well, I said, well Phil, I'd call the deputy sheriff for crying out loud. And he said, well, what's the difference then turn it on the computer and surfing the net and paying to bring that same stuff into the living room. Or paying HBO or Cinemax or all of these other services to pipe it right into our living room. It's still strangers were being entertained by that which Peter said abstain from fleshly lust. For they wage war against the soul. And I would ask you the question, how pure is your vessel? How sanctified are you? Listen, if all you do is change your behavior, you haven't been changed at all. All you've done is polish it up and shine it up a little bit, but Jesus Christ changes us from the inside out. That's why you can't live the Christian life unless you're a Christian because Christ reaches into the depths of who you are, where He lives, and He changes your heart from the inside out. And Josh McDowell made a great statement. He said the best case for Christ in this world today is a clear presentation of the gospel validated by a life that has been changed. And if Christ hasn't changed your, your heart, and if He's not changing you from the inside out, all it, all it is is behavior modification. All it is is just a shine. And Paul says, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I'm different. I'm changed from the inside out. He's changed my want to. Are you changed from the inside out? And then Paul says, there's a faith. I've been crucified with Christ. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Faith. At the very beginning of his ministry, he wrote Galatians, and in the second chapter, I live by faith. And at the very end of his ministry, almost 20 years later, he wrote 2 Timothy chapter 4, and he says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course. The third thing he said is, I have kept the faith. From the very beginning to the end, but from that moment to this moment, Satan, the world, and enemies of all kind tried to beat Paul, out of the ministry, tried to discredit the Jesus in Paul so that they could point and see and say, look, Christ doesn't make a difference. But from the beginning to the end, 
He said, I have kept the faith. I walk by faith. And all faith is, is believing God at his word and bringing my life in accordance with what he said. That's what it is. I believe you, Lord. It is the word of God, completely true. I accept that. Now I bring my life in accordance with that. And Paul says, I've walked by faith and I have kept the faith. And at all points in between, I've stood firm. I haven't quit. I've put my eyes on Jesus. I've put my eyes on the finish line because you know what? Flesh won't hit the finish line. Faith hits the finish line. You can try all you want to in the flesh. You won't hit the finish line, but if you walk in faith, you'll get there. And you can read story after story of those that have counted the cost and kept their eyes on Christ and they've hit the finish line in faith. I don't think I can even express in words how frustrating, sad, and brokenhearted I get when I see a pastor or a fellow minister who's gotten beat up, bruised, bummed out, busted out, broken, and they go down and they go out of the ministry. And there are people that you once knew to be giants of the faith, walking strong in Christ, and because of life, and because of opposition, because of all the persecution, and even sometimes falling on their own swords. They don't hit the finish line. They're broken, they're bruised, they're bleeding, and they get out. I don't think I can tell you how sad it is when, when as a pastor you see members that are on fire for Jesus and they're raising their hands in worship and they want to go tell people about Christ and they want to be disciples, they want to go on mission trips and they want to live for the Lord and then life happens. It gets tough and, and the devil tightens the screws and, and Satan throws all these enemies against us and we make mistakes, we miss it, we stumble and we fall and what once was a person on fire for Christ. Years later you see them as their pastor and they don't come every Sunday, they come every now and then and then eventually they check out entirely and you think, oh, what happened? And Paul says, I have... I have walked by faith and I have, I have kept the faith. Over 20 years ago, uh, I'm trying to imagine maybe 22, 23 years ago, Mary and I were in our second church and I was probably trying to do a lot of things in my own strength, my own ability in the flesh, not by faith. I was preaching several times a week in the church. I was going to meetings, visiting people, and uh, man, it was 100 miles an hour, full steam ahead, and I was loving it. But it was in the flesh. It was in my own ability. It was in my own strength. I went to a conference, and the man said, it was a, a conference by Gary Chapman, who wrote The Five Love Languages. Have you ever read that book, The Five Love Languages? And he said, guys, I want you to go home, and I want you to find out from your wife, uh, I want you to write down the five most important things to your wife. And then I want you to go home and ask your wife, what are the five most important things to you? She'll, she'll nail it. She'll get it because you, you spend money on it. You talk about it. You do it. That won't be hard. She'll go boom, 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 boom. These are the five most important things to you. But then he said, I bet you can't get one thing in order when you try to say these are the five most important things to my wife. And I, I sat there in the audience and I thought, you know, this is a no-brainer. I got this. My wife, it's going to be babies, 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 babies. I wanted two, she wanted three, so we had four. I mean, that, I mean, bassinets, baby rooms, strollers, babies, 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 babies. Not a problem at all. And so I got home and I said, Mary, I want us to do something. She said, this is homework, isn't it? I said, yeah, kind of. And I said, listen, I want you to tell me what are the five most important things to me. And she started laughing. She said, that's, that's easy. It's, it's golf, it's cars, it's, it, it's, you know. And then she listed all five. And, and I went, Wow. I mean, you didn't even have to think about that, did you? And she said, no, I mean, that's easy. And I said, well, let me see if I can't name five most important things to you. And she said, there aren't five. And I said, um, there are not? She said, no, I just have one. I said, just one? And, and guys, have you ever realized I, I shouldn't have asked that question? It's like this, I, 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 feel, I feel something coming on I wasn't expecting and she said, Jim, look at me. I just have one. And, and this is 20-something years ago. She said, I just want you to be a man of God. That's all I want. I don't want babies first, a nice house, a nice church, a nice place. I don't want that. She said, Jim, look at me. I want you to keep your eyes on Jesus. 
And I'm not saying you're not a man of God, but that's what I want. You ask me what I want, I'm telling you. I want you, my man, to be a man of God. Because when you're a man of God, you won't leave me. You won't hurt me. You won't embarrass me. You'll protect me. You'll honor me. You'll care for me. You won't cheat on me. You'll love me. You'll be with me. And folks, I mean, she has broken me down. She has broken me down. And she said, and I will follow you anywhere if you're my man of God. And I decided that day I would pray a prayer every day for the rest of my life until the Lord calls me home. That I would be, by the grace of God and through His power and for His glory, I would be a man of God. And my prayer is that one day when life is over for me and I've drawn my last breath and, 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 and they bury me and cover me up with that dirt and I'm in the presence of the Lord and Dr. Cantor says some nice words over my grave, that my church will walk away from that graveside and they'll say, thank you, God, that our pastor was a man of God. That my children will walk away from that graveside and they'll say, thank you, God, that my daddy was a man of God. And that my wife will walk away from that grave and she'll say, thank you, God, that my man, my husband, was a man of God. Because that won't be a resume. That'll be a testimony. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me for a moment. I'm going to invite Tim and the musicians if they'd come. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to speak to those of us that are here today that may not yet know Christ. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ, I want to let you know with every head bowed and every eye closed that you can walk in here lost, but you can walk out saved. If you die without Christ, the best that it gets for you is simply a resume. But your testimony can begin right now. It can begin today. When you, sitting here in this auditorium, can simply say, I want to turn from my sin and I want to turn to Christ and I want to receive Christ into my life to be my Savior and be my Lord. That's where your testimony begins. And it is my prayer that you will not walk out of here today with only the best that this world can offer, but that you'll walk out with the free gift of eternal life that Christ offers to all. And if you're sitting here and you believe that the Lord is calling you to make that decision and that step of faith of trusting Christ as your Savior, I want you to slip your hand up right now. Because the best that it gets, apart from Christ, is a resume. But if you like to begin, for the Lord to begin writing a testimony of your life, I want you to raise your hand where you are. If you're here today for the rest of us who are saved and many of us who are called, I wonder if you'd be willing to say, I'm not dead yet that you'd come to this altar and say, I want to be. I'm not dead yet, but I want to be. You slip out from your seat right now and you come onto this altar. I wonder if you'd be willing to say, I know Christ dwells within me. He lives within me, but I'm not changed yet. And I want him to change me from the inside out. I want him to change my heart and change my life, and make me fresh and new in the image of Christ. And I wonder if you're here today and you're thinking about the finish line. I wonder if you'd be willing to say, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to put my eyes on Christ. I am going to chase hard after the Lord. I am going to be passionate. But I'm going to lay down my life. And I'm not going to quit. The devil's not going to kick me out. The world ain't going to kick me out. Enemies are not going to discourage me and beat me down. I'm putting my eyes on Christ. He's the centerpiece of my life. And I'm keeping on, keeping on. I'll put my eyes on the Lord. I'm not quitting. I'll hit that finish line. I'll hit it in faith by the grace of God, by the power of God in my life. I'll hit that finish line for His glory. If you're here today, and you'd like to take the next step that the Lord is calling you, would you make this your life first? I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but 
Christ who lives in me. What a joy, what a gift, what a privilege. In the life that I now live, right here, October the 24th, 2013, I live it by faith in the Son of God, the living, reigning, ruling, soon returning Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Oh, can I give him any less? I give my life to Christ. You come. As the music plays, you come. May the Spirit of God move in your heart. May this be a powerful moment. You come. You come.